Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns here. There is a huge energy wave that's currently rippling across our planet and in fact across the entire solar system causing different energetic disturbances. For example, here on Earth, we've had Luotobi Laki Laki volcano explode multiple times, sending ash up more than six miles into the air. We've also just had Tropical Storm Eric rapidly intensify into a hurricane and that immediately set off a magnitude 5.8 earthquake as it's starting to make landfall. You'll notice that there's a rapid intensification of this hurricane right after the 1.2 X-class flare that we had on the sun less than 24 hours ago. Here's that earthquake, boom, 5.8, a storm quake. And this solar flare that occurred, this massive explosion on the sun was exactly earth center direct in Mexico happened to be on the sunlit side at that time. So we had the X-class flare, then we had a rapid intensification of this hurricane, then we had that earthquake really nicely showing the connection between all three systems. And in general, there's just a lot that is happening at this moment in time as it relates to solar activity. New coronal mass ejections have launched from the western limb out towards Saturn and Neptune. We've had these Earth directed solar flares and we do have some solar storm impacts that are coming in any moment now. So in this video we'll do a quick breakdown as to what is happening energetically with the Sun and the Earth and then we'll go into detail as to the connection that exists between them. Here we have a video for that 1.2 X-class solar flare that occurred less than 24 hours ago. I did a live stream on this last night but check out this explosion. A massive burst of light all of a sudden being emitted from the Sun from explosion many times the size of the Earth. The Earth is about this large right there. So if the Earth happened to be right on that sunspot during that explosion, it would not be good news for us. But thankfully we are at one astronomical unit and this solar flare did not launch a coronal mass ejection, which is the expulsion of plasma out into space. So we don't have a solar storm headed our way from this 1.2 X-class flare, but there are some other solar storms already inbound from some lesser flares that occurred before this. Those impacts are expected today, maybe tomorrow, perhaps even a little bit later if they're really slow. But we do have some enhanced solar wind plasma headed our way. We just received a big burst of light radiation from this. And the interesting thing about this flare, if we relate this to terrestrial events, is that Mount Luotobi Laki Laki in Indonesia, it erupted violently right before this flare and then it also erupted again afterwards. And sometimes we see this connection between solar activity and for example volcanic eruptions where they're clustered together really closely in time. It's almost indicative of the fact that there is some underlying energetic wave that's moving through affecting both systems causing them to respond. That could be the planetary geometry. We are approaching critical planetary geometry on June 21st. I've been discussing that quite a bit on the channel. You can screenshot this and read this graphic here. So that could be just in general creating a stronger electromagnetic circuit across the entire solar system. Therefore perhaps triggering these stronger energetic events both with the Sun and with the Earth. And we have new solar plasma shooting off towards Saturn and Neptune, a very critical component of this planetary geometry. Let's check it out. Here's our latest 304 Angstrom imagery of the Sun which really nicely shows us some of these plasma explosions and prominence eruptions and plasma filament launches. This is the Earth facing side of the Sun. Most notably you'll see Sunspot Group 4114 right there. It's given us a variety of solar flares now, an 8.5 and 6.4 M class flares and then just recently that 1.2 X class flare but it's not the only area of activity right now. You'll also notice some plasma filaments blast off. You'll notice some plasma eruptions, especially here from the Western Limb Solar Coordinate System. And this is important because as it relates to our planetary geometry, this is exactly that alignment of Saturn and Neptune. And in about a week, maybe 10 days, also Venus and the dwarf planet Ceres in the asteroid belt. They're all gonna be lined up square to the Earth because of course the Earth is looking at the Sun like this from our view. On the far side of the Sun we have Jupiter about to perform a superior conjunction and on the 21st we have Mercury and Mars conjunct together in a line square to the Earth. So that is the grand cross geometry that's currently active. And this just means that all the planets are along these preferentially aligned gravitational vectors and plasma has mass, the sun has a bunch of plasma, very highly vibrational matter. 
these charged ions, but they still have mass. And so if you have these more aligned gravitational vectors that perhaps can cause disturbances on the sun and therefore things like solar flares and then other sorts of solar activity. Meanwhile, here on Earth, we're having these significant energetic events like the eruption of Mount Luotobi Laki Laki and now also Hurricane Eric barreling down on Mexico. Here we have a graphic showing the evolution of Hurricane Eric from a tropical storm to a hurricane over the past 24 hours. We're looking at band 14 long wave infrared radiation on the right. On the left, we have the advisory that was put out by NOAA. And in the bottom left, we have our solar X-ray flux during this time frame with that line synced up to what we're seeing with the graphic imagery on the right. And that was taken by the GOES satellites. These are geostationary satellites that can track all these changes. So you see that this tropical storm is getting closer to making landfall. Then right when that X flare hits, it pulls back a little bit before rapidly intensifying the vorticity increases, that rotational speed. And then we get that magnitude 5.8 earthquake to pop off just a little bit to the west. And that is a classic signature that we see often with these hurricanes in the Pacific because we have some significant faults with Mexico and then of course the San Andreas running up past California. Whereas for the Atlantic Ocean, we don't really have that many faults that hurricanes can trigger. Now we don't often get tropical storms or hurricanes to form these cyclones in the Pacific, but when they do, it's not uncommon for them to create storm quakes because of the pressure differences, the atmospheric gravity waves, the alterations to the ionosphere and more. We saw this in fact with Hurricane Hillary in August of 2023, which barreled down on Los Angeles and that then ruptured a magnitude five plus earthquake right as it made landfall. So here we have multiple examples in the Pacific of cyclones forming and then pretty significant earthquakes rupturing just nearby as a hurricane is making landfall. Here we have our USGS latest earthquakes map and we can actually see that there have been three earthquakes right in this zone where we now have Hurricane Eric. And so the, the strongest of them is this magnitude 5.8 there, that rupture at 949 universal time. So that was after the tropical storm had intensified to a hurricane. There was an aftershock that followed just minutes afterwards with this 4.7. And most recently, in fact, we have this 5.4 there just south of El Salvador at 11.57 universal time. That one's at a depth of 81.2 kilometers. That one's quite deep. The others are shallow, but we do see this temporal clustering of these three earthquakes. And again, Hurricane Eric is basically right in between them, a little bit closer to these two, uh, these two earthquakes, but this one is still not that far away. So definitely a connection in time between Hurricane Eric and these three earthquakes. And there's also the connection in time between that X-class flare and the hurricane. And we know that there are some physical connections between the sun, the earth, and the lithosphere of the earth. And so uh, it's really a pretty clear example in my mind showing the connection between solar activity, tropospheric weather, AKA like cyclones, really strong storm systems that seems to enhance them and also earthquakes that rumble underneath our feet. Now let's explore that physical connection a bit more and do a research review. The paper is linked in the video description. But there's strong waves and turbulence in the atmosphere, these meteorological disturbances. Ionospheric plasma and geomagnetic field disturbances can be observed. Geophysical processes with large energy release in the lithosphere like earthquakes, atmosphere like typhoons, hurricanes, and storms, and the magnetosphere magnetic storms and substorms all occur in geophysical shells. Basically showing that the Earth has these different geophysical layers and they all have different large energy releases that are possible within them and all these layers are connected together. Ionospheric disturbances generated by intense meteorological phenomenon occur in a narrow frequency band of three to five millihertz, which is extremely low frequency, able to pierce really deep into the crust and also extend very far out into space through the ionosphere. Atmospheric processes also affect the electromagnetic field of the ionosphere. That's important because changing electromagnetic currents in the ionosphere induce the telluric currents in the lithosphere. And if you have stronger telluric currents in the lithosphere, you could potentially overload that fault zone with more electromagnetic energy than it's able to hold, break chemical bonds, all of a sudden you get that rupture across the fault. 
It's all about the critical stress threshold of a fault at play. A rise in the electromagnetic noise level and plasma density in the ionosphere over typhoons and hurricanes has been detected by LEO satellites. And these disturbances were localized and the quasi-stationary electric field changed by up to 25 millivolts per meter and concomitant variations in the electron density of up to 6% over regions with strong atmospheric disturbances. So that's quite significant, 6% change in the electron density over an area with a strong atmospheric disturbance, hundreds of kilometers below, showing that even though there's very large gap between a strong atmospheric disturbance like a hurricane, it can still notably change the ionosphere. And it's the ionosphere changes that can influence earthquakes. So, and I'm gonna go into that paper next. I just wanna quickly show you here, you can see the wind speed dynamics of this Vong Fong Typhoon and then the geomagnetic index, the DST, a measure of the geomagnetic reading current, also just overall geomagnetic volatility. Look at this drop. It went all the way down to about negative 40, negative 45 uh, nanotesla on the DST, which is pretty significant because typically the DST index if you follow this, is hanging around zero unless there's a geomagnetic storm. So just that right there shows how much the DST can be influenced by a hurricane passing nearby. Now, if we go specifically to a paper that looks at atmospheric electric, uh, electricity coupling between earthquake regions in the ionosphere, uh, we get a few key highlights. We explain changes in the natural extremely low frequency ELF radio noise observed in the topside ionosphere using the Dementor satellite at night before major earthquakes. And pre-seismic atmospheric electrical changes are one of the many possible predictive effects that have been noted. So basically, there are often electrical changes in the atmosphere that occur before an earthquake. And they have a few different things that have been noticed. A decrease in the atmospheric potential gradient near the Earth's surface, typically 100 volts per meter, in undisturbed weather conditions has been observed before some earthquakes. So your normal atmospheric gradient going from the surface up to the ionosphere, which has a voltage of about 250,000 volts, there's a decrease in this potential gradient sometimes observed before earthquakes. Ionospheric changes have been associated with events originating in the lower troposphere, such as thunderstorms. So earthquakes have been suggested to cause a similar coupling between the lower and upper atmosphere. So even thunderstorms can influence the lower troposphere and ionospheric changes uh, are also associated with those lower tropospheric changes. So these things are all connected. And the global atmospheric electrical circuit links charge separation in disturbed weather regions with current flow and fair weather regions. Basically what this means is that when you have a big meteorological weather system at play, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a thunderstorm, a tornado cell, those big electromagnetic changes that are happening there are connected to the rest of the uh, surrounding area that's not experiencing those strong weather changes and electromagnetic changes by this fair weather current flow. This occurs as a result of current flow through the ionosphere and the Earth's surface. That's how they're linked together which in relation to the atmosphere in between present upper and lower boundaries of relative high electrical conductivity. The air, or the atmosphere, the lower atmosphere is not that electrically conductive, but the earth is, and then the ionosphere is in relation to it. So the ionosphere starts at about 80 kilometers in altitude, depends on the time of day, some other factors, and is typically maintained at that positive potential of 250 kilovolts with respect to the surface by the integrated effect of disturbed weather activity globally, such as thunderstorms and shower clouds. So there's a bunch of energy contained in the ionosphere. This is fed by the sun. This is fed by a whole bunch of different things. When there's so much energy up there and you have changing electromagnetic current flows in the ionosphere, it can create these strong tiller currents, which can potentially trip a fault and create an earthquake. It should be noted that there is substantial natural ionospheric variability due to solar and geomagnetic effects. So uh, while the uh, ionosphere can change due to uh, strong meteorological conditions in the lower atmosphere, and it can also change before, during, and after earthquakes, it also changes due to solar and geomagnetic effects. And as we have solar cycle 25 maximum in 2025, we can expect more of these phenomena like strong storms and strong earthquakes, especially on the tail end of solar cycle 25 when the earth has been loaded with a bunch of energy. 
That's it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching and please subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with what is happening energetically here on Earth. We examine on this channel significant geologic events and geophysical energies like the Schumann resonances. We also examine what's happening with the sun, solar activity, and space weather, even planetary resonances, the geometry of the planets, how that affects us. We even sometimes zoom out and examine cosmic forces. I bring all that together, present videos nearly daily. So if you like the sound of that, then please subscribe. Smash that like button to help the channel grow. Thank you all so much for your support. Wishing all of you well. And I'll see you all in the next video.